So welcome everyone. I'm Rochelle. I head up the Alumni and Development Office at Trinity Hall and we are delighted to partner with the Natural Sciences Society to bring you this event this evening. Um, as I said, uh, you can turn your cameras on and off and also we've kept you muted on the microphones, but if you want to ask a question, then please do join in later on. Um, I'm going to hand over now uh, to our two Natsuki Society presidents, but we will have our fellow in natural sciences, Dr. Rob Asher, moderating, moderating uh, this evening. He is a senior university lecturer in zoology and curator of the Museum of Zoology here at Cambridge. So I'm now going to hand over to Sarjan and Levia just to say thank you all for joining and I hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you so much. Yep, so hi, um, Sarge and I are current presidents of the Trinity Hall Natural Science Society. We just wanted to say thank you to Temi and Ella for speaking, um, the alumni office for hosting this and Robert Asher for moderating. And thank you all for coming. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, you can hear about our events on the Facebook group, uh, which most, most of the Trinity Hall scientists should be part of. Excellent. Thanks to both of you. Uh, like Shell said, my name is Robert Asher and I shall moderate. And I thought it might be worthwhile to just give you an idea of how all this started. Um, some colleagues of, and, uh, of mine in the museum have you know, come across this term. I very recently came across this term decolonization. And um, I, I very recently in the context of a couple of decades actually of working in Museum, so it's probably bad that I only heard of this quite recently. Um, I mean, my particular bent is on the sort of um, the uh, you know the primary literature side of things. Um, of, on occasion, I I'm involved in some of the exhibit planning. Um, so, despite that, and like I said, I only heard about this fairly recently. And so, um, my reaction is sort of mixed. Uh, to this term, and this is kind of, I'm just, forgive me for my somewhat stream of consciousness narrative, but this is sort of, I hope, articulating why this event is happening now. Um, and the, I think the one thing that is pretty unquestionable, and anyone I've ever spoken to about this certainly agrees that what we show in a natural history museum really is um, a small part of what you could show in a natural history museum. And some of those you know, if you picked a specimen in our museum here in, in, in the University of Cambridge, um, there is a fairly disturbing past to many, many of our specimens and sharing that information ultimately, I think is, is a good thing. Now, speaking for myself, I sometimes worry that the pedagogy related to my particular field, which is evolutionary biology, I mean, we, we tend to think, we convince ourselves at least, that what we're talking about is really, you know, pure science, right? We were talking about comparative anatomy and, and geology and, you know, the tree of life and biogeography and conservation. I mean, there's really a very, very long list of things that for many years, people, uh, myself included in natural history museums have, have been concerned about. And whenever something new comes up and decolonization, I think is one of those, there is a worry. And again, I'm speaking for myself that we're adding another element to that long list of things that we're supposed to convey to the public, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, unpack this term decolonization and indeed incorporate into our exhibits. It just means that it's not gonna be easy necessarily and something else is gonna to have to suffer, right? Something else will have to fall down in level of importance because that's really, you know, the public who strolls through a natural history museum, they don't have all day and we have a limited amount of time and space in which to reach them. The other thing I, I worry about with this term decolonization is that, again, this reflects my own naivete perhaps, but I still think that there is a, real, a reality out there, a reality to biology, to chemistry, to physics, to mathematics, and indeed to economics and politics and social science. Um, all of that exists certainly on, on the biological side of things, whether or not humans are around to notice. Um, and whether or not, you know, my ancestors come from a certain part of the world or some other part of the, part of the world. And yeah, I mean, I worry sometimes that the, the concept of decolonization 
could potentially make it seem that aspects of biology really are results of human power struggles and culture wars. You know, I don't, I'm, but this is, I'm slowly leading to the reason why this event is happening because um, human culture and, and, and this kind of discussion about uh, the relevance of race, human culture and race to, to learning, there's no question that that has a big influence on all of our capacity to learn. And so that's why we're here. And on a very much more specific note, it just so happened that some far-sighted individual told someone in zoology to post the link to Temi and Ella's podcast, the in On Integrity pod podcast. And all of you have a link to that in the invitation to this event. And I believe it was your first podcast, uh, Temi and Ella, the, um, on 23rd of August. It's still available on the on the On Integrity podcast at anchor.fm. And I listened to it and I thought you guys had such sensible things to say and I really enjoyed listening to that. And so with the help of the, of the um, Natsuki Society President Saj and Levia, we, we got together and we said, we really should invite these two to enlighten us some more on this topic. And so here we are. And I think then on that note, I'm going to hand over the stage to the two of you so now is your opportunity. So now Temi and Ella will share screens and unmute themselves. And so another, you, uh, yeah, another logistical thing, I, I will mute myself during your talk, but I will uh, uh, scan the uh, list of participants for any raised hands. I think though, what we probably should do is we'll, we'll let both of you finish and reserve the Q and A to the very, very end. I mean, it is physically possible if some one of you wants to raise your hand in the midst of it. Um, you know, if there is a convenient breaking point, um, I may uh, drop in. But I, I think unless it's urgent, I will hold back and let Temi and Ella finish. Um, good. Well, then that is all the prefatory comments I have to say. And without further ado, thanks so much, Temi and Ella, for agreeing to join us. So hello, welcome everybody. My name is Ella and I'm a third year biological and natural science student. And my name is Temi and I'm a third year psychological and behavioral science student. And well, you're listening to us live. <laughs> and welcome to our talk on decolonization in the natural sciences. And this will be a discussion about museums and curricula and how sometimes they often lack integrity. So we've organized this hour into two main parts. We're gonna start off with a critical look at the past of natural history and really bring in some interesting examples which you may often see in your museums or in your curricula growing up but there's some aspects of their story which aren't explicitly stated and aren't talked about and then we'll move on to part two which is really a discussion we encourage you to engage with us and bring in your own feelings on what the responsibility of museums and academia have to address these issues of their past We've included this quote below because it's from a really interesting paper called da from Das and Lowe in 2018, um, which really addressed some of the topics we're going to be talking about today. And I've included it as more of a thought point for the as we move into part one. I think it's quite a strong statement to say that science, racism, and colonial power were inherently twi entwined um, and could be suggesting they're almost one and the same thing. And I've included it here just as you go through the examples, seeing if uh, the points we raise kind of draw you closer to this idea that they are inherently entwined, or maybe you have a more nuanced view on the subject. And I think a great place for us to start is just to consider what natural history is. I see a majority of us in the call today know what natural history is, and if you don't, we've left a little definition on the screen. Um, but we do have to, we do identify that natural history has a very long history and spans back um, many centuries. However, I think a great place for us to focus on and to kind of guide our discussion today is focusing on um, the role of collectors, because when they were collecting, we often, when retelling their stories and re-showing their works, we don't really consider the political and social context in which they were collecting these items and, and pieces of knowledge around the world. So I think we should look at a couple of examples today. Um, so first I'm going to start off with probably one of my favourite examples to talk about when thinking about the link between natural history and the slave trade, and that is Sir Hans Salone, the man on the screen behind. And he's a really interesting example um, because he's someone who has contributed heavily to natural history research and the knowledge we have today, 
But there's some aspects of his past that are less talked about. And those are the aspects I kind of want to address, as well as the great things that he's done as well. So who was Sir Hans alone? Well, he started off studying medicine, but then it developed an interest in collecting after he um, just researched about um, classifying plants and was greatly influenced by his good friend, John Ray, uh, the esteemed botanist and also the, the former fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. But his journey into collecting really started in 1687 when he was appointed um, to the College of Physicians. And this meant he became the personal physician to the governor of Jamaica. And this meant he got to aboard the HMS assistance and travel from Britain to Jamaica. And John Ray is said to have said that um, it was a great opportunity for the young botanist. So why was a trip as a personal physician a great opportunity for a botanist? Well, to answer that, we have to look at what he actually got up to on this trip. So as well as being a physician, uh, Hans Sloan got the chance to visit many islands in the Caribbean and actually collected 1,000 plant specimens on this one trip. And there were many good things that came from him collecting these specimens and also it propelled him into this world of collecting and allowed him to do many future um, trips across the world. So I think probably the most tangible thing we can recognise is the, the effect that he had on medicine. A lot of these plant specimens, when brought back to Britain, were used in treatments um, for certain diseases. One example is Peruvian bark, um, which actually became a highly valued fever treatment of the time. Another impact that he had was on diet. So when he was in Jamaica, he actually discovered, um, well, he actually heard about this local delicacy, which is drinking chocolate. And he brought this back to Britain initially for its health benefits, um, but it came just an enjoyable drink over time. And I think one interesting part is actually, it's said that some aspects of his original recipe um, were then later sold to the Cabri brothers. And then therefore his work may have influenced the chocolate that we eat today. But I think the biggest impact and probably the most relevant to this conversation on natural history is his impact on public knowledge um, through the size of his collections throughout his lifetime. So both on this trip and all the other trips he got to attend, um, he amassed a collection of over 71,000 items. Um, and this went on when he died to become the founding collection of the Natural History Museum and the British Museum. And in his will, Salone described it as being for the improvement, knowledge and information of all people. He also published a two volume book, um, as we can see on the screen behind us, about his trip to Jamaica. His trip to Jamaica alone, those specimens, formed an eight book herbarium, which is still accessible for us to use online today. He even had a number of plants and animal species named after him. One example being the, pl the plant genus Slonia or the species of moth, Urania slonus. So we've recognized the, the kind of great things that his work contributed to. But there's some aspects of his work and his life which are less explicitly talked about in the museums or in the resources that we find on him online. And I think probably the most fundamental thing that is not really explicitly addressed is the fact that the only reason that he was able to travel to these places was because his work was coinciding with the existence of the transatlantic slave trade. So the fact that, trans that there, was, um, this, there was boats going from Britain to Africa to America meant physicians or other workers such as him could go on these boats and actually reach these exotic places. And that's probably what John Ray was describing when he said it was a wonderful opportunity for the young botanist because there wasn't a lot of money going into research of the time funding these trips. Uh, another thing is that he greatly relied on, on the knowledge of local people. So when we see his work, we often see it being described as Stallone's collection. But what you don't actually realize is that a lot of these specimens were actually collected by the enslaved Ghanaian men and women who were working under the governor of Jamaica and were bringing him specimens during the day. And then another example with the going back to drinking chocolate was again, this is a local delicacy, but Sloan, um, he learned this from the people, modified the recipe and then brought it back to Britain when he would, where he would receive the profits from it. And I think it might be easy for um, us to kind of think that maybe he was not necessarily directly involved with it. Maybe he wasn't aware of what was going on, but I think there's probably two points which kind of mean this is not necessarily the case. So he actually published a book on the, pu on the punishment that were being inflicted on slaves at the time, which is extremely graphic and um, kind of suggests that he was working really within these systems. And obviously we cannot say that he was necessarily um, inflicting these damages that we so often associate with the slave trade, but we can definitely say that he was aware and um, he was, yeah, not ignorant to the, what was actually going on there and was working within it. And the second thing would probably be the fact that he married into it. So he married the daughter of the plantation owner um, in Jamaica, and this was Elizabeth Langley Rose, who he married. Um, and the profits from um, this plantation went on to fund his later collecting. And I think this really shows how his 
um, knowledge and resulting um, his knowledge, his expertise and resulting wealth was really influenced by the slave trade and can some could say would be directly linked. So do we recognize this sufficiently today? Well, I think it's still important to recognize that this isn't something that's so separate from our knowledge today. We still use many really um, ancient, as you could say, like natural history collections, for example, in ecological and evolutionary research, we look at specimens from the past. So he still plays a really important part in our knowledge today. But I think when we talk about him as a character, um, this is almost this lukewarm tone that we use when um, describing him, describing his work, which is not necessarily true, the explicit things that he was involved in. So for example, the Natural History Museum website, the History and Architecture page, describes Salone as a high society physician who traveled the world finding exotic specimens as he went. And I feel, and although later in the article they do mention the slave trade, it's not explicitly shown that um, his collection was largely a result of the slaves collecting specimens during their day and during their work. And secondly, I read a paper on him called The Life and Legacy of Sir Hans Salone. And after this massive, interesting article about all his work, the final sentence in, in this paper was, that a man of relatively humble origins rose to such prominence is a tribute to his hard work and diligence. And I think in kind of the points that I've talked about today, although his work was likely a huge result of his hard work and his moving up the ladder or whatever you could say, um, a lot of his work is attributed to the fact that slaves were collecting specimens and they had their own local knowledge, which influenced his resulting wealth and expertise. Um, and yeah, and I think this lukewarm attitude is not necessarily true to what he's involved in. And I think that needs to be more explicitly shown in our museums when we talk about Sir Hans Sloan today. And I think Ella brought up many, many good points. And I think we can see reflections in the next person we're going to speak about today, who is Maria Sibla Merian. And I want you all to kind of consider how we can both celebrate, but also be critical of people in our past and people who we, you, who we use their work today. And, and how we utilize them and how the ways in which their work has been collected can influence the way in which we view them. Not necessarily the scientific method itself and the works itself, but our broader understanding of um, science within itself. So Maria um, Sibylla Merian was a German born uh, naturalist and illustrator. Um, and being a woman in a very male dominated field is something that she should honestly be proud of must have not have been easy to have connections or people to look for and, and help. But what did help her in one of her major works of metamorphosis was the ability for her to travel to Surname on a slave trade ship. Um, and this trip um, is where she amassed a lot of her um, collection and a lot of her works are, honestly, you guys should go <laughs> look at her art. They're really beautiful, if I do say so myself. Um, and Surname was a Dutch colony and it constituted of 6,000 African slaves and obviously the people who would look after, run the state and actually live there. And she would observe plants, to go on walks, look at like insects, but then she would also ask, not necessarily ask, go tell um, the slaves to go bring her um, items that they would see in the field, anything they thought was interesting, anything that she could illustrate and, and, and observe. And I think, um, that kind of dynamic will be something that we, we can talk about later. And um, this work ended up being published and is one of her most notable works in 1705. And I think her trip and her ability to even navigate this, being a woman in a very, uh, I don't wanna say sexist society, um, misogynistic society and very limiting for women to do anything necessarily academic. Um, for her to be able to do this due to the presence of um, trade slave ships. Um, I think it one highlights how we can celebrate her being such a powerful woman in, in the domain that she was in, but also criticize the means in which she was able to do that. But also I think it both Maria and Sir Hans alone, how both of them, their works were mainly possible due to the existence of the systems that um, slavery had put in place these slave trips, um, slave ships, the, the labor, the people that they could tell to go do these works. I think there's a relationship there that we can just simply not ignore. Yeah, and I think there's those 
there was two good, really good examples about how natural history and the slave trade are often linked. But I think we can't forget that other sciences also resulted, um, the, the knowledge that resulted from them was also linked to the slave trade as well. And the example I've got here was the Royal Observatory, the Cape of Good Hope, which is actually the first major observatory in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was built off the back of slave labor. And interestingly enough, the first astronomer of the observatory who oversaw the building process, so likely managed a lot of these slaves, was Fearon Fallows, who was a Cambridge mathematician as well. Um, and I think this is a great example to talk about alongside natural history because, so, so right, this building alongside many other buildings of the time were built uh, from slave labor. And that's not something that we can change. But through the years, measurements from this scientific institution have been taken. Similarly with natural history, this, the original specimens have been used year on year on year. And no matter how much we temporarily separate ourselves from this in the initial building process, no matter how much we intellectually gain from these institutions, we can't take, we can't always, we can't just forget about the origins which were embedded in slavery and um, colonial mindset, right? And yeah, I think, again, with science, it's almost harder because you can't always give back information you've gained from, like you physically can't and you, you wouldn't want to anyway, right? Because there's, there'll be no point giving it back if you've gained from it over time. But I think the way we can pay respect and that we can, um, yeah, recognize this is to really keep talking about uh, the origins of these places and not think that they're irrelevant just because they may not directly benefit the scientific knowledge that we have today. Um, so yeah, having these attitudes of being, again with Sir Hans Sloan, being explicit about their origins, uh, because it's just not having integrity to kind of ignore them and just take the, the massive amount of knowledge we've gained from them as it is without recognising the social context and political context under which they were built. And I think another great place where we can look at is how slavery and physiology connect, purely because we've spoken a lot about how the transfer of knowledge has uh, of occurred, but I feel like we need to talk about how the exploitation of physical bodies has actually presented itself throughout history. And um, if we, for example, look in um, in America and how um, in, in slavery times, um, black women were seen as these physically prominent women who were way more pain resistant than that of their white counterparts. And that interest and that intrigue into understanding those differences, we weaponized the, the understanding of we can use observation and our scientific um, skills in order to kind of exploit these women. So they would run these experiments and examinations on these women where they would actually just necessarily brutalize them, put them through torturous, um, things in the disguise of they're going to help cure their ailments or cure their diseases and a lot of the time these women didn't have a choice it, it, it highlights how black bodies in particular were seen as easily accessible easily manipulated because they were seen as lesser and I think we can see reflections in that today the the same stereotype that black women are more pain resilient has effects in um, hospitals and and how Black women, because of that notion, if they do complain about particular pain, for example, in childbirth, um, they're often, there's a longer duration as to which when they receive care in, that compar in comparison to um, white women. And as a result, we can see statistics like in America, black women are three times as likely to die from pregnancy related issues um, um, in the US and five times as likely in the UK. Um, and I think that simply just can't be ignored. And I think if we bring it back to the UK, there's an example that I would like to discuss with you, which is Saratij Bartman. And in 1810, um, she moved, well, she was taken from um, South Africa to England by her employer, who was another South African man, purely for the sake of how her physique and her body were extremely different. And there's a picture, which is obviously an exaggeration, um, but as you can see, she had a protruding buttocks and she had thicker, a thicker body, thicker build. And that was so different and so scientifically intriguing for these men in England. And they would pay to examine her body, to pay, this is a bit graphic, to pay to touch her genitals, her bum, her everything about her with, without levels of understanding that they wouldn't do that to their white counterparts because she was seen as this freak of nature, this, she was known as the hot and tot Venus. She was othered very seriously to the point where they would they could use her body as a medical fairground and enjoy all of that. Um, and I think 
later on we can see remnants where when she moved to Paris where she again was subjected to the same sort of treatment um she passed away and um her body was dissected so her reproductive organs and um her her reproductive organs were taken out and put on display by George Cuvier, who was a founder and professor of comparative anatomy in the Museum of Natural History in Paris. And then those remains would end up, would end up in the Museum of Man until 2002. 2002, and this woman was alive, aged 21 and 1810. And I think that resonates with me a lot, purely because it's not something that is so put in the past and we can just forget about it it still follows when the discussion is still open her her her, not, her body was not returned to her home city in south africa to, until 2002 and again that just re reiterates the notion that black bodies and black knowledge and, and and slave knowledge and slave bodies were not necessarily seen as valued and they could be exploited and manipulated all in the name of observation and scientific research so I think we've looked at some really thought provoking examples of how both natural history and the other sciences have been uh, somewhat linked with the slave trade and colonialism. So I think this is where we can start to move on to the point of what is decolonization and what is specifically decolonization in the natural sciences. And as uh, Dr. Robert Asher said, I think it's important to define it because a lot of people don't necessarily understand um, what we mean by it. And that is just a product of the term itself because it's it's a broad term, right? And in different fields, decolonization can mean different things. Um, but we've presented this definition of what we feel it is today, um, both because we think it's productive for the discussion we're going to have later in terms of the questions we're thinking about, and also productive in putting measures in place that can actually um, really cause uh, change and really cause improvement in the natural sciences. So we've said that the history of natural science is often presented through the white European colonial lens, which is consequently selective with the stories that are told. We think of decolonization as the movement to challenge and mitigate the disproportionate and often harmful legacy this lens has had through designing education to recognize the impact of this selectivity and to present science's past with integrity. And I think we've done a lot of talking about um, particular figures that have both done great things for science, but also understanding that there are underlying social and political contexts about that. So I think that one good thing that we could do today is talk about what museums have actually been doing. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the Natural History Museum in London. And in 2007, they had a project called Slavery and the Natural World. And it was a way of exploring the way in which natural sciences and natural history has accumulated its wealth of knowledge but how that was intertwined with slavery. And it's, again, a very, very good read. And I would, I would hope you guys would all take a look at it. But I'll just pick out a couple of chapters from the document that I found was really interesting. And one of them was people in slavery. And we've done a lot of talking about particular figures like Sir Hansen and Maria, which the Natural History Museum also mentions. But they also do mention people who are hidden and sort of suppressed in a way that their works aren't as well spoken about people who are not as necessarily known even though their works have contributed greatly and I think taking a look at that um, particular chapter would help explore the world of how many people have actually been forgotten in history but their works kind of live on beyond that and I think there's a lot of um, rel um, relevant examples that we can talk about in the discussion later um, but there's also another chapter which I found was interesting was a transfer and exploitation of knowledge, which highlights kind of the role in which where power is placed on a particular piece of knowledge shifts the dynamic of how that knowledge is then received. So, for example, um, if we take the Sir Hans Sloan and the hot chocolate, which was a local delicacy for um, the uh, the slave peoples and the local peoples in Jamaica, but then now that could be taken and still being prof like profited from till this day. And I think that kind of dynamic and who holds the power and who kind of can twist it into a way that other people can now claim it as their own. Um, and there's plenty of other chats that I would all recommend you guys um, to all take a look at. But I do want to make a point that this was in 2007 and 
I was, what, roughly eight years old at the time. That was the time that I was going to natural history museums. And maybe, yeah, okay, I was eight and I might have not understood the sort of complexities around it, but it took some digging to even find, not digging, but it's been such a long time that I would hope that this would be a continuous discussion, not just necessarily a one-off in 2007. It, it's probably more relevant now than ever. And I think that more work needs to be done to uncovering more. It's not just simply these few figures in time. But I think now, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to our talk. Um, we hope you've given you some food for thought and some things that we could discuss. Um, and I'm hoping you guys have, I don't know, necessary things to come back with us with or any questions, but we have a couple of questions on the screen here that could possibly help lead your thoughts or a way of uh, engaging with us. Um, but we would love to engage with you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I would only add that there is an option under reactions to do a virtual clapping, as I see many of you are doing. Oh. Well, well done, you guys. Thanks so much for Thank that you. very informative and enlightening presentation. Um, so really, the, uh, the floor is open. I see the hands that are showing up are, it looks to be a standing ovation. <laughs> and, and the hand that illustrates the, the uh, desire to ask a question, I don't see yet. So that being the case, I, perhaps I'll just I think there uh, are a couple ask. Of hands up. Um, there are, I beg your pardon. Well, you, you can go ahead and, and name people that you happen to see. Ah, I see one, Katerina. Yes. Don't forget to unmute, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, hello. That was a really fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. I just, I have um, a question on, you mentioned hot chocolate and how it, um, people, um, for example, Sloan profited from that when really it was something that was like a delicacy to the local peoples there um, in uh, in America. And I wondered if, because my personal view, I don't know if I, uh, I mean, I understand crediting people who gave it to Sloan, but I don't know if really there should be a transition in who owns hot chocolate. I feel like in a modern, perhaps what would be a less damaging view is to have no one take ownership of things so much. I don't know if I've made my point so clear, but I don't know if um, by making people take back things and own them, does that not create more more issues on like, then you create more contrast and sort of more um, like arguments and conflict between different people. Or perhaps if you just sort of, sort of think like, well, we can credit in the past, but now perhaps it belongs to everyone. And not just in the context of hot chocolate, obviously, but in yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think the hot chocolate example is just like one thing that mm -hmm. would have been an example of knowledge being taken at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the point that we're trying to make is that, especially with knowledge, especially with natural history, you can't always return these things. And yeah, what good would it do to be to reallocate hot chocolate today? I don't know if that would have much significant impact. But I think the fact that we're talking about these things, uh, that that work was was maybe stolen might be too strong, but it definitely did happen in some cases, um, that, that whoever told the knowledge was the one that kind of got recognition and maybe resulting profit from it is something we should recognize in the past because um, I think there's still aspects that this may be happening today, um, especially in the scientific field, maybe this is getting too much, but <laughs> like, as in, um, I think there's been lots of studies that kind of look at, um, the, the different collaborations between different countries and things like that and, and how uh, people collaborate on papers and everything. And uh, there's a lot of views that maybe from certain countries, the information that's told there is less, it is, is promoted less than yeah. other, than the work that's told from other countries. And I think it's just something to recognize that we have to be careful um, about uh, taking knowledge from other groups of people. I think, yeah. Um, and just to build on Ella's point, just a, a tiny bit, it's just, I think it's more in a broader sense of how often, I think if we take it just, <laughs> hot chocolate was ne not necessarily a, a very good example for us to use, but I think if we look at it in a broader sense about how often European knowledge is kind of seen as the pinnacle um, and every other form is not necessarily valued in the same way. And I think if we look at it in that kind of sense, it's kind of just trying to, 
not necessarily give back the knowledge because again that's counterproductive but opening that discussion on the fact that it's not just one particular lens that we should look at all the time I think that's kind of the angle we were trying to go with but again I can see how the hot chocolate example works a bit yeah yeah all right yeah thank you Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. So I like the, this first question on the discussion, how might information about the collectors mm -hmm. enhance an understanding of biology? It sort of comes back to what, to what Rob was saying about, oh, you know, maybe science is objective. Maybe actually there's nothing that this can tell us because it because doesn't matter who collected it. What we're, what we're doing is, is the truth, searching for the truth. But it, it brings to mind the, the sort of the when you had the early colonial naturalists in, in North America spreading out across the, the continent and shoehorning everything into the Linnaean system, um, which we like now, but only because we understand about evolutionary history. They didn't understand that then. Um, so you've got people like William Bartram and he's going out and, and discovering all these things and deciding what their linea Linnaean classification is. At the same time, of course, ignoring anything that the local people knew about these organisms because it didn't fit into the western mindset and so i imagine that a lot of native american insight into into their natural history was lost um, and i'm just wondering whether we feel that there is some sort of actual there is information that 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 we miss or, or perhaps perspectives that we haven't had because everything was shoehorned into a particular scientific mindset I think that is a very, very interesting point. And talking from, for example, a psychology aspect um, in general, um, because I can't, I don't want to speak on biology. Biology is not necessarily my domain. Um, but I feel like, again, there's so much value and, and in others' perspectives. Diversity breeds innovation. That is a quote that me and Ella live by. Um, and I think understanding how like how much potential knowledge is kind of lost in history and kind of lost from a lot of colonial expansion and, and the focus on European knowledge can kind of affect that. And I think you bring up a very interesting point. Yeah, and just to, because that diversity breeds innovation was actually the title of a paper that we read. <laughs> and it actually found that um, the, if there was increasing diversity in lab groups, then apparently there was more innovation there. And there's actually looked at, it was a really massive study. It was about a 30 year study or 40 year study. And it looked over the near complete population of graduate students in the US. Mm -hmm. And they actually found that, yeah, so increasing diversity within a scientific group um, leads to more innovation. But in turn, the actually, the underrepresented members of the group received fewer career benefits uh, um, as well. As mm -hmm. It's like, this is actually found in the paper. And I think that's interesting, again, going back to Katrina's thing about how, um, you know, what's the use of recognizing, or well, that's not what you said, but you know what I mean? Like identifying how yeah. it's important to recognize who actually came up with these ideas because we are seeing reflections today where people um, are innovating, are putting the work in, but they're not being sufficiently recognized in comparison to um, maybe their um, white counterparts in the mm -hmm. group. Um, so yeah, I can say that we, maybe we are losing things today. And I think that's why it's important to reflect on how people were excluded in the past, because mm -hmm. if this is still continuing, then there is going to be a significant impact on academia today. There is a comment in the group chat that I would like to uh, read. Mm -hmm. um, but before I do, perhaps I might just uh, ask you a little bit more on that most recent point in terms of diversity leading to innovation. Do you think in an ideal world, the human cultural categories and race, which are of course sort of leak into or, uh, or end up being biological categories or have biological aspects to them. Um, do you think in an ideal world, the diversity that you're referring to that leads to innovation really would ultimately be about how you think. It would be an internal aspect about the ideas and the motivations and the uh, experience of a given individual, which happens to have some correlation today with where you grow up and you know your your genetic heritage that exhibits itself in things like skin color. But but I, I I'm 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 kind of thinking out loud. Do you agree with that general notion that really in an ideal world 
the diversity that leads to innovation is actually, it's about thinking. It's not about skin color. Or do you think that's very naive and wrong? I wouldn't want to call you naive, but um, I do think that just simply saying diversity of thought is so not necessarily a privilege to ignore the fact, it is a privilege in a way to ignore the fact that race, class, gender, sexuality, all of those combined provide and create an, a person with very, very different um, experiences and attitudes towards life. So uh, cis, white, middle-class male will have very, very different perspectives to the world and perspectives to how they interact with information in comparison to, for example, a lesbian black woman who is working class. Um, do you get what I'm like? It, it's what you not say could be true. I don't know. I, you know, I think that that's a, a, a generalization that is probably true in many cases. In other cases, it may not be, but it's a generalization. And also, I just want to, um, and geographical location as well. Um, there's there's those factors affect as well because some in Western societies or they're like anyway Western societies um, you could argue there's possibly some more similarities but for example if we um, go to for example Nigeria many from where I come from um, there could be very different perspectives. And, and notions into the way you, again, interact with knowledge, which can potentially, because you have different understandings of the world which could potentially make something very, very beautiful because you're exploring it in more than one different aspect. Um, but yeah, that's just, yeah, because it's quite close to my heart. But I'm gonna stop talking now. <laughs> no, you won't. We want you to keep talking. So I have Cyrus, then Alex, uh, in terms of people I call on first, but before I do, I yeah. want to read to you, it's not really a question, but I just want to read to you, if I may, the group uh, chat comment. And this is from Silvia Perez Epona. And Silvia says, scientific colonialism is still taking place. Many studies in tropical areas are still led by researchers from quote unquote, Western countries without including local researchers in the project or publications. Mm -hmm. It's not really a question, but I don't know, do you guys agree with that? I think, yeah, I do agree um, with that statement. I think it's interesting because we actually found a paper that really looked at this and we can like link it at some point as well. But it was a 2009 study looking at the aspects of neo-colonial science in Central African research papers. Mm -hmm. And they found that over 80% um, of the Central African research papers were actually produced with a collaboration outside the region. And actually um, pretty much all of the countries were co uh, collaborating with their former colonizer. So that the evidence from that study really backs up what um, the comment in the chat here. And I think what's also interesting to note is that in these papers, they found that there was a significant skew on, um, well, one, the topic that was actually being researched and two, the actual work that the individuals in that collaboration were, carried out, were, being, were carrying out. Mm -hmm. um, so the topic that was um, by far, by far, the majority was the, was um, tropical disease work, right? And I think this is obviously, you, you can't say that the fact that um, this is the majority of the work going on is a bad thing because obviously everyone benefits from tropical disease work. But I think it is interesting to note that um, that is where the fund, when when um, the collaborators fund these projects and they get involved with them, that is the projects that they're interested in doing mm -hmm. in those countries. And I think the second thing that's interesting is the fact that um, they found that the people who were in the Central African countries doing the research, they tended to be on the field work duties and um, doing those kind of roles, whereas the collaborators from outside the region were the ones um, doing like the data analysis or the writing up of papers and things like that. Fair enough. I suspect though, I mean, I, I think it would be, un it, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I suspect it would be incorrect to say that there's some sort of nefarious force that's demanding that people collaborate in certain ways. I mean, there's a natural kind of economics to academic work that mm -hmm. you know isn't egalitarian by any stretch i mean that's kind of the whole point of academics i mean you most of you listening here well certainly our two speakers are undergrads at the university of cambridge and like it or not you are in a place where most people want to come but cannot mm -hmm. right this is this is not an egalitarian kind of situation and i just wonder if the um 
you know, the kinds of collaborations that you're referring to with, and I, I'm adding more interpretation perhaps both to the, the individual who posted the comment and, and in your answer, that this is somehow bad. Maybe you, maybe you think it's actually just, this is how human intellectual achievement works, um, but maybe you do think it's bad. I don't know. I think, I guess my point though would be that, um, I mean, first of all, is it a negative thing necessarily? I mean, when you consider the alternative, which is somehow, so I don't know what would manage this somehow, would, would there be some kind of compunction among um, universities or funding agencies to say that no, uh, a scientist from the University of Cambridge, no matter what your, you know, if your byline is, is Cambridge, then you cannot be the corresponding author on a, on a paper with colleagues from, you know, uh, a non-European country. Is that the kind of thing you're sort of thinking about or, or, or does that seem draconian to you too? I just personally think that the fact that there is such a significant skew between the kinds of roles that people are doing, it, it's kind of difficult to ignore it purely because we can see, especially with these, these particular countries, they're collaborating with their former colonizers. We, we can't ignore that connection. And I think that's just, for me, what is interesting about it. I'm not necessarily saying it's a, I'm 50-50, if I'm gonna be completely honest. <laughs> like, Fair enough. work does need to get done. And I think it is important that, again, we have a variety of um, knowledge and all of that. But also if the, the European countries that where the colonizers are coming over and doing the data analysis, which is where the interpretation comes in, which is where the, the understanding comes in, and they're the ones majoritively controlling that element. Again, it kind of, maybe I'm jumping the gun. I just, I think if it's going to be a collaboration, I feel like it, it needs to be a, a way more involved process personally, but yeah. yeah. I'll just add a couple of things. I know everyone probably <laughs> wants to move on, but um. Yeah, I think it is not necessarily a bad thing all the time because you've got things like funding being provided to these mm -hmm. places, which um, mm -hmm. I think there were some findings in the paper, yeah, that funding is obviously a significant um, aspect of these collaborations yeah. as well. Um, but I think what we're just trying to say is we have to notice that these kind of ties or these reflections to these ties still do exist. Mm -hmm. And um, just um, observing these collaborations and, and the skew there, um, is, yeah, it's a reflection to the colonial past and it kind of shows us that it's not too recent. These We always talk about like, oh, this happened in the past, but we're recognizing that it still has reflections to today. Yeah. And therefore it's, academia is not exempt from these political and social uh, things that have happened over time. Yeah. Cyrus. Um, hi, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, can you? <laughs> yeah. um, okay, what happens? I'll take my earphones out, but... Um, can, can, can you hear you loud and clear? Yep, very good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so firstly, thanks to the speakers um, for your talk, it was very interesting. Um, and thank you um, to the uh, society heads for um, bringing you here for, for a great discussion. I have um, less of a question, I have to admit, than um, possibly, hopefully a contribution to the discussion. Nice. Um, and hopefully maybe trying to bridge a little bit of the um, kind of difference in perspective that I think um, Robbie might be having as well between um, scientific knowledge and scientists as idealized bodies of knowledge and idealized knowledge creators and um, science as a historical object. So um, obviously like, yeah, I mean, I've graduated from physics uh, uh, just last year, I, I share the um, sort of feeling that through the scientific method, you know, the, the truth will out kind of eventually in the long run of history at T equals infinity, like we have to sort of like the scientific method will sort of guarantee that eventually you come to reasonable conclusions. But when you look at actually the progression of how science works, um, the example that they gave of um, the collector Sloan, the, the um, the transatlantic slave trade being so important and specifically transatlantic travel is a perfect example of how the progression of history necessarily influences the progression of scientific knowledge um, and to the extent that these examples are still around um, sort of 
pulling back from necessarily specific policy prescriptions about how to change institutions. Um, we have to sort of recognize that we are still in a historical process. Um, and so while there aren't necessarily like, while I agree at all, I don't know, maybe we should collectivize hot chocolate, but may, it's not as straightforward as, you know, trying to go back and right all the wrongs of the past is, I think, more about a kind of engagement with, um, yeah, with the idea that, you know, it's the, these concepts still apply to us and um, because- I, I like your term engagement is um, a self-historical object, it, it is changeable. Um, and, you know, it's very different to how it was done back then. So we can sort of look at these huge institutions and say, I can't think of how it would be done differently, but I also can't really imagine you and I sort of jumping on a, on a random trading vessel to go, you know, hop around and get like factory workers to go collect, you know, samples for us. Like, you know, the scientific process changes over time. Um, so it's really a kind of problem solving or critical versus um, purely observational kind of perspective, I think. And I think um, Sylvia just brought up a really good point in the chat box that links to what you said and um, the idea of like not hiding behind, um, she says not hiding behind this is how the system works. And I think that brings up an important point that Scientific institutions and museums often present themselves as being apolitical and um, that they're, they're not affected by all of these social factors. But I think that is quite, again, ignorant to do so because the social and political factors are what drive what is being collected, where it's being collected, how it's being collected, how the knowledge is gathered, how it's um, manipulated, how it's observed. And I think um, by having these institutions kind of, not so, yeah, own up to the potential um, damages that has occurred or how they've collected things and like other people have collected things. And I think by doing that, it opens the discussion, it allows for change, it allows for people to engage more, as particularly, I don't also like to tell me that BME, um, students, people to engage more with a, a system that seems to acknowledge the wrongdoings that they've done in the past. Yeah. Thank you. Alex. Hi. <laughs> uh, well done you two on, uh, that was a really interesting talk, like, and a lot of uh, interesting, interesting points brought up. Uh, I was, I was particularly interested when you were talking about how we have this history of using um, black bodies for scientific research without the consent of those involved. And it really put me in mind of um, Henrietta Lacks, yes. who's um, of the HeLa cells, I'm sure we're all aware, but um, those cells are obviously taken without her consent, without her family's permission, and are still being used without like, they have no financial benefit, but they were also fundamental in like, I think they were the first human cells to be cloned and they're used in cancer research. So the scientific progress they have allowed us to achieve it, like cannot be ignored. So I was wondering what your guys thoughts were on when we have these, um, these things like, so HeLa cells, like the collections we have that were collected under the influence of the slave trade or um, through like colonial pressure, how we then can sort of take that into account and then move forward with it. Like, what do we, it's, uh, yeah, I guess kind of how do we sort of reconcile the sort of unsavory origins with also the great good that we've seen in scientific progress because of this? I think bringing up Henry Alakis is a really, good example purely because it detaches us from the notion that this was so far away like Henrietta Lacks happened I think in 1951 sorry if I'm wrong but very very recently grandparents are still alive parents are still alive that were around in that period of time and I think if 
if we're aware that it still hap it still happens in our recent history and it can it's still happening today. And by exploring the, the roots in which these practices or how these kind of came about, understanding the roots and kind of attempting to kind of dismantle them and have a reflection as to the way scientists themselves engage with research. And I think Sarah's got that good point of detaching it from the scientific method and scientists themselves. Um, and I think by doing that and, and having an honest reflection can move us in hopefully the right direction. Um, I don't want to get too sociological here with like other bigger systems, but in general, when we're talking about science, I think having that honest reflection of the past and understanding the roots in which we can see those reflections in 1951, in 2020, um, is really important. Yeah, and to just go off what Temi said about it being really recent, like we're even seeing examples of potential cases where exploitation of black communities could be happening today mm -hmm. in the scientific world. I don't know if you guys saw, there was an interview done, I think it was a couple of months ago, um, on COVID and there was some French scientists discussing mm -hmm. what should be done about um, COVID trials mm -hmm. on the news. And uh, I think they actually suggested, well, I know because I watched yeah. it, but they, they suggested that um, the COVID trials should be done in African countries because, um, well, they were justifying it through the idea that people may be more, uh, less likely to follow rules there and use masks and therefore there'd be quicker infection rates and therefore that would be an ideal place to do these trials and see how it spreads. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's like obviously one isolated example, but really picking up on where this happened in the past and recognizing the kind of trends about um, using other countries and different people to do things is, is just really important in that. But I think what you've brought on to a really good point is how we can um, use our museums, use our education systems to, uh, in a really effective way to get across this knowledge. And I think, yeah, that would be a cool thing to discuss. Um, yeah, I think, is that a similar question? Yeah, carrying on the conversation and yeah, implementing these into curriculum. So uh, do you want to say your view and I go into mine? Um, you should just go into yours. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to my So, yeah, I think it is difficult because, especially with um, what Dr. Robert Asher was saying about museums, there's limited space, there, mm -hmm. there's limited attention spans of people going into those museums. So what, what you're going to put on that tiny placard explaining the specimen, like, you've got to really be selective about what you put on that placard. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, so from that point of view, I understand that it's difficult. But I think what could be... Uh, a really useful point to move forward is when we do talk about Salone in these separate exhibitions or these separate articles online, just being really explicit. And I think there's links to curriculums as well, being really explicit with the way we talk about it, not having this kind of, oh yeah, um, he was collecting and he was, it was all exotic and mm -hmm. he was traveling. Being explicit about the links, like mm -hmm. I think we've tried to do today. Um, and yeah, and I think almost now things are moving online. This is actually a thought I had today. It's like, yeah. as things are moving online with COVID, I think the issue of space on museums, it's it makes it easier now because people are going to be relying on more online resources in terms of maybe schools taking um, information from the Natural History Museum website and everything. If there's really effective um, uh, um, online resources from museums and things like that, then that is really the base for what schools can use to start teaching these topics. Because again, similar to the small placard, curriculums are, uh, are stretched and teachers don't have much time to um, go and get all these resources and put them together. But if um, museums can provide um, really efficient um, and really useful resources, then maybe this will allow schools to um, fit these into their schedule as well mm -hmm. in terms of talking about these topics. And just, yeah, finally on that, I'd probably just say also that um, just, when we talk about science, when we talk about history, really recognizing that they're, they're just not separate things. And I think this goes back to the point about the political and social context of the time. When we teach about the history of science and everything like that, um, we have to recognize, well, when we talk about science rather, we have to recognize the context it sits within. And I'm not asking like a whole reform of the education that we don't have like history or science anymore, but yeah, just in some way being explicit in schools about these issues. And I, again, that's a difficult thing because you obviously teachers and everything, and you don't want to expose children to things if you don't think they're ready. But I definitely think having a more integrated conversation about how the, the history behind science is definitely going to be a productive way going forward. And I think I just want to bring up a point. I shouldn't have to wait until I'm 20 to be studying a module in my degree to learn about things like this. I just, 
I, I don't it's I can't blame my school I can't blame anybody else but I feel like I sh it shouldn't like I chose a module that not everyone else even did so history, history of science module um I don't know if there's anyone else who did it but I did the history of science module um and there's so many things that were very enlightening to me that I shouldn't that I think I should have been taught almost like five years ago GCSEs but again we can't force a, a, a dramatic reform of the curriculum but I do think it is important that that notion is kind of discussed a lot more and can hopefully one day lead to that slow implementation um, into the curriculum but again as Ella I just want to reiterate that natural history museums have the means to do so especially with now moving online um, the natural history museum did it in 2007 they can do it again um, and make it better different types of resources I'm not just saying the document YouTube videos a lot of people engage in visual media as well and I think there's a lot of means to do that um, and you know again museum creating is also an, an, it's, it's an art um, and I think again spreading that out into other mediums will be beneficial in both our understanding future generations understandings and um, the way history is now presented. Thank you. I see hands raised from Harid and Joey Bream. Harid, you go first. Thank you so much for that presentation, guys, um, and for the excellent discussion now. Uh, I was what I have a question. Um, what do you guys think is the proper relationship between like of like science and science is meant to be objective, right? Science is meant to be give us knowledge that we can believe in. Um, however, like like from your presentation, we can see that that's not always the case. Like um, social context actually matter quite a lot, and it matters who's doing the science, who the science is being done on. All of these things matter. So, what do you think? How do you think that how we think of science should change? Because it's not like like people, uh, I think a, a contributor before was talking about how like science progresses. However, I, I want to point out that the mistakes that science makes is often are often not random. It's not just uh, like these mistakes come from like actual social inequalities and, and like political and and other things. I was wondering how you guys think um, we should think of science now because we can't the me the method the scientific method doesn't work. In a in a vacuum, like it, it can't progress without social and political changes at the same time. Oh, yeah. So, just what you think? It's <laughs> a it's a bit of a ramble, but yeah. no, it's, good. It's, it's, it's it's a good question, and I think um, again, separating scientists and scientific method um, is a very important way of doing that. And I think one massive thing is again to stop, like viewing science as this very apolitical institution and everybody who's part of it is also now apolitical. Um, and, and it's an extreme example, but if we look at eugenics um, and um, how that was, especially in America, how that was used, the, the, the findings um, were kind of taken, manipulated and then utilized. Um, and then further research was now use with that skew of understanding in order to justify continuing segregation, continuing a eugenic thought and oppressing certain peoples. And I think, again, science is done and collected for application, for better understanding. And who are these applications and better understanding for? It's for the people. And again, it's just a very, entangled relationship between the two that we can't ignore and I think it's not necessarily that the scientific method itself is faulty but I think addressing that the people within scientific institutions could potentially have political agendas that can now manipulate that scientific method if that makes sense and and yeah oh that's a big question <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add, but I think it is really the, the almost pun with our like podcast name and everything like on integrity, the fact that the scientific method itself um, is said to have integrity and said to be robust and repeatable and everything, but really does the presentation of science have integrity, and I think um, we've seen in intentional times when it's been shown not to have integrity just through this kind of uh, Eurocentric view on the on the past of science and which examples are talked about, but also 
um, like today when we're seeing collaboration, things like that, like which knowledge is more important. But yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to say that you would want to just change the whole way you rethink science because mm -hmm. I feel like that gets to like quite dangerous narratives of like, I don't know, just, yeah, just taking science away completely. And I don't know, that kind of worries me a little bit, but mm -hmm. I get that we yeah, we need to obviously like we're saying that we need to rethink the way we think about the scientific past and whether we can actually take all this information about hands collection and everything as face value of just mm -hmm. being um, a product of their hard work and everything. So I will ask Joey Bream to add to ask his question next and then after him we have a, a comment in the uh, chat box from Sarah so Joey you're up. Hi guys, thanks for that. that was really cool. Also, thanks to those who are facilitating this today. Um, my question was, if I'm not wrong, you said that black women in the UK are five times more likely to die from childbirth complications than their white counterparts. I was wondering what the, whether there's a role in science and education in addressing that. Ooh. I think it's yeah it's a really topical example because I don't know if you guys saw I think that yeah the government released this kind of race in Britain report thing today and that was like one of the notable things that was in there the fact that um well not notable but in within the medicine section that um British black women were five times more likely to die of childbirth than their white counterparts and they actually said that they had no measure in place for how they're going to solve this or how they're going to come from this so I think yeah, in a way that's kind of worrying initially mm. that they did say that. You guys can look up the article <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you don't believe me. But, um, <laughs> like, but also it's kind of the honesty of that they really don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's, because yeah, government, science, you can't really call them like the same thing or anything. But I do think science has a responsibility to kind of address these systemic racist like ideals in medicine mm -hmm. itself. For example, if you look to, the medical curriculum, um, a lot of the stuff that came out in all the Black Lives Matter discourse mm -hmm. was that the medical curriculum only used examples on white skin. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of feedback into the, into the later years when these doctors are operating on, um, on black bodies, on Asian bodies, and they, you know, there's certain skin conditions that just look completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think coming back to your question, I think then science does have responsibility um, for this initial education process in universities to use a diversity of skin types because I think hopefully this will later result in being able to better safeguard the health of black women and black men and yeah um basically non-white people in yeah. the in the NHS as well and um yeah so I think I do think they have a responsibility to kind of uh think about that yeah and just to quickly add on that I just think that um again there's Doctors have agency. We, we can't remove that from them. But I feel like there also needs to be some unpacking as to the reason as to why. Because as I mentioned, like often a lot of you would hear, especially in the US, um, I've read, I've watched a couple of interviews, a lot of doctors kind of believe that black women just have higher pain tolerances so they can hold out a little longer. Because again, that also leads into, you know, medical institutions being underfunded and being oversubscribed. And, you know, there's a lot of issues within that. But I think unpacking what has historically kind of found itself into current day of the way in which you perceive people can be a, 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 a way of then now how is that the science and the medicine applied to people? if that makes sense. The people are doing the applying, we need to unpack both, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, now I would like, if I, oh, I'm sorry, Joey. Just saying, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> then um, I would, I will now read this uh, question from Sarah. And before I do, I, I have to disappear for about 15 seconds. So I'm gonna read the question you answer it. I'm still going to be able to hear you, but you'll see my image disappear for a few seconds. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, Sarah asks everyone, and Ella and Temi in particular, how do you propose we carry on the conversation of decolonization in the sciences? Question mark. Do we include this in, in curriculums? And if so, how? I think 
we touched on that um, briefly because I think we, we saw the question when we were um, answering that roughly. But I do think, um, I think because decolonization in the science is a very new thing, because we see, for example, in Cambridge, we see decolonization in the sociology, um, I don't know what's happening in English, but <laughs> decolonization um, in sociology, and that's a, a, a very large movement. But I think with science, because there's the complexity of often people thinking we're trying to decolonize the scientific method itself, often people want to disengage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think simply by continuing this discussion and, and opening it more and engaging with academics around, for example, I'm, I'm not, but just engaging with people and getting them to understand how, again, science isn't just this apolitical force that behaves solely in its own bubble. Um, and yeah. yeah, do you want to add something? Yeah, so basically that, yeah. and basically the stuff we talked about before with education systems mm -hmm. and the resources that museums can provide. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, obviously I'm not a museum creator <laughs> or anything, but like in terms of aiding schools in their way that they can uh, communicate this information. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also maybe leading on to a, an, the next discussion point maybe could be the idea of looking at really the problems uh in representation at an academic level mm -hmm. so i think that is uh considering those problems and, and recognizing again with the whole idea that science is not a political science mm -hmm. very much exists within like social and political context looking at um the representation uh, in management fields in like pi level and everything i think that is part of the conversation and to address um yeah because we think we think about it in with all the black lives matter discourse again we've, mm -hmm. we've looked at um, who's in different roles and everything yeah. and I think science can't be exempt from that uh, kind of critique mm -hmm. in terms of who is actually taking on these roles as well. You're on mute, Robert. Cyrus and then Jack, sorry about that. Hey, <laughs> sorry, with um, studying online I should really be better at this by now. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I was sort of thinking about um, what you're saying about um, the need to kind of um, take scientific, um, the scientific sphere out of this kind of idea that it's apolitical um, in the sense that maybe, or what, what do you think of this idea that maybe it's, it's sort of less important that we talk about you know, th these particular historical issues in say physics classes or chemistry classes or whatever, um, because, you know, time is limited people, you know, I think that's clear, like what all the arguments for that. Um, but obviously like in our kind of social world is and educational sort of wider, um, whenever we talk about history of science, we should talk about these things and we should, um, have a greater consciousness of it in general, but um, one way that this kind of um, repoliticization of it um, could be significant to the way we do science is that um, people who design scientific institutions shouldn't see the socio-political landscape around us as like a fixed constraint. Like, you know, when we look at, okay, can we found, make this foundation can we institute this research program or people that do um, sort of meta research about how to design institutions, how to design programs, et cetera, they should maybe be open to the idea that, um, you know, the way that we organize our society, the way that we organize um, ourselves socially should be variable. And so maybe, you know, a prescription would be, oh, there's this um, constraint around, um, you know, underrepresentation in one particular area, or the fact that um, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe in ecology, something to do with the kind of um, necessity for certain um, countries to destroy natural and have a, uh, natural environments to um, for for economic reasons uh, inhibits our ability to study whatever insect i mean that's that's a common um area of study but that is an example of how um like the political environment directly 
impacts our ability to do research and, and sorry so <laughs> to, to draw to the actual question like what you think of the idea that um um it's you know part of this politicization should be around the way that we build institutions and the people that do that in the scientific community being more engaged with you know seeing um the world around us as variable rather than a kind of fixed constraint for how they do science yeah it's a big yeah it's a big <laughs> yeah. kind of thing and i think initially focusing on focusing on the academia side of things in terms of representation uh, as like separate to the whole conservation kind of side of it things and um yeah i think institutions do need to realize that the coincidence that there's only three black students out of i think 600 people studying natural sciences in my year yeah is not a coincidence and it's a result of um you know people it's a result of many things yeah. <laughs> and yeah and i felt like people were going to be want me to say those things but um yeah i think growing up and and seeing one thing in terms of like role models in terms of um people mm -hmm. who look like you in these institutions mm -hmm. is a massive impact on uh whether you choose to go into certain fields and i think this is linked to your point because it's thinking about um the social context around and whether that we should change institutions whether we should um, have certain programs in place potentially to encourage people who are underrepresented at undergrad level um, or further to choose science. So yeah, I think we have to recognize that it's not just coincidence, it's a result yeah, of maybe not seeing role models. Maybe this is a result of uh, the kind of narratives in museums or curricula that natural history was, the origins of natural history were um, of the white man's domain, you know, with Sir Hans Sloan, we, we, we think of his collections as Sloan's collections and we don't recognize the Ghanaian men and women who were involved in that. And that in turn, you could say that um, by saying it's just his collection really kind of indicates to people or who are reading that display mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, science was started by the white man and it wasn't started in other countries. So that's one aspect to it. Um, and I think, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, also, I think the one thing about science is really the lack of stability as a career role or the lack um, in terms of the financial side of things. So in terms of funding, it's such a complicated process to kind of get funding if you want to do masters or PhD. It's like a really difficult process to navigate. And I think this is an impact in deterring um, certain groups of people from taking it on as a thing that they want to do, because if they seek science as something that well, I think, so I'm trying to look at postgraduate stuff at the moment and a lot of the um, funding opportunities are so obscure and so like, oh, you could get it all funded or you could get none of it funded. And therefore I feel like this definitely deters um, groups of people from choosing it because I mean, why would you want to if you if it looks so um, look like lucrative in the way yeah. that you get funding for that? So yeah, there's a lot of social political things that impact um, science as an institution as who is actually doing the work. And I think, yeah, the representation um, and the, the the job being such a, a variable thing in terms of financial side is definitely an impact in affecting who we see. And I think there's probably other reasons that I'm not remembering here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, that makes that makes like 100 percent sense. And I, I would be the 1000th person to you know point out about how like the kind of way that postgrad um, fellowships, for example, are structured um and kind of temporary contract continued temporary contracts affect people who want to start families i.e um women to a large extent um as in in terms of kind of the time commitment reproductive labor etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think sort of what i'm trying to suggest is maybe like on a some kind of grand scale as well because like we do have not that it's um you know, sufficient or done or anything but um that like organically like people know that this is true that society affects the way we do science affects the way that we the the kind of scientific scientific knowledge we're able to acquire mm -hmm. um but maybe part of decolonization and part of the consciousness raising of examining people like sloan is kind of thinking on a more grand perspective like, okay, Sloan was able to do this because he was able to travel across the Atlantic. He was able to travel across the Atlantic because of the kind of incentives, all the various things of, of involving the involving transatlantic trade. Um, and 
in the sense that, yeah, um, people who are in the sense that like everything is political, people who are involved in building scientific institutions shouldn't be afraid to comment on kind of grand historical trends as well as um, kind of, yeah, more sort of micro issues um, when researching but uh, <laughs> um yeah but that's like yeah thank you very much uh, I was, it was interesting to hear your thoughts yeah hi uh thanks ella and Tammy. it's a brilliant talk i should say i'm a bit of a gate crasher here i'm one of rob's colleagues at the museum the assistant director of the museum of zoology and i wanted to ask um those of us working in decolonization in natural history museums probably could fit our work into two categories um one is finding those hidden people uh, that have been obscured by Eurocentric versions of history and then trying to tell the truth about their contributions to the history of science in, a, in exactly the way you just said, Ella, that, that might, the impact of that might be then to inspire more people to see actually more, more people that look like them are behind the history of science and the, it's not all just white men. And there's obvious, an obvious possible impact of that. The other category is more about the, what was the, the kind of main thrust of your talk, and that's telling the truth about the problematic aspects of the history of science, and showing that many of the people we celebrate are, you know, have, have benefited from the exploitation of people, benefited from racist hierarchies. The, the challenge, I think, one of the challenges we struggle with in museums is is evaluating the benefits of that second category. So, what what do you think? They are, and and what I'm really asking is, is it enough for it just to be the right thing to do, or do you think that it will change the way that people engage with museums? I think, personally, simply, it is enough because it is the right thing to do. Um, but also, I, for someone who went to Natural History Museum relatively recently, um, pre-COVID times, as a grown adult, um, I think it is. I want to say magic, but it's really inspiring seeing such a massive collection. And but then I do find myself having just one particular perception of okay, if I was to for some reason ever go into this, um, I'm just going to talk from a personal standpoint. I wouldn't see myself there purely because it it doesn't feel like an inclusive space. And we can talk about like how museums in general are, are kind of tailored for a particular group of people. But um, I do feel like if we're thinking about inspiring younger generations and continuing that discussion, if museums are kind of give a tone of exclusion, slight, I don't want to offend anybody, <laughs> but like a slight tone of exclusion, there's so much potential that you, like that has already been, people have disengaged with, if that makes sense. I think there are probably so many little boys and girls who, oh my gosh, this plant species looks so cool. <laughs> or like, this bird is so cool, I would want to do that. But then again, all the things that Ella's spoken about, it's like, it's layers, engaging with them when they're young and continuing that discussion. Museums play such an important role, especially a lot of schools um, go on school trips to museums. And that's when they first get exposed to this kind of knowledge, not necessarily in a textbook, but actually if they have a museum like that, that's me just being biased because I've brought up in London. Um, but I think having that exposure and that honest reflection, like for example, it could be as simply as like having those hidden figures plastered and their ex exhibitions or those works shown and someone could be like, oh, that looks like me. But also I think it's important that the humanity of people and how they work is also shown. I think if that makes sense, because again, plastering them as this isolated pioneer who only did good isn't necessarily the case and especially in today's current climate is not necessarily always possible um, but yeah yeah very similar things and I think yeah I think it definitely is enough to just be the right thing to do like museums stand as places yeah as you said as truth as to tell us to tell the whole story behind things and, and I think if we look at how much people have been excluded in the past then there is definitely a right for these things to be um talked about and to be really shown today because now people are starting realizing that they should be doing this and therefore we shouldn't be shy about talking about these explicit these explicit paths behind it but again yeah the the kind of 
the other thing about it is, is really this commitment to change and diversity. So we've talked about the reflections that these colonial histories have. And if museums are committing to actually showing these to people, then, um, for example, in the Natural History Museum's case, like owning up to the fact that they were founded, which I think they probably have, but like the fact that they were founded um, by Salone's collections, it really shows people that they're committed to not letting these things happen again. And yeah, um, not letting these reflections take place mm -hmm. because we're now going to be telling the whole story about things. We're going to be giving recognition to everyone that's, um, you know, the people that were involved in collecting it. And yeah, I think it is really important. Thanks much. So there's a, a fairly long comment from Tiff to everyone. And I wonder, rather than my reading it, I wonder if Tiff would be willing um, to, to articulate that. Before I before that happens, though, I wonder, Jack, if I might um, press you a little bit on your comment that you just made. The, you, you had your comment in two parts. And I think mostly what, what I heard was the discussion regarding the second part, right? And the first part you phrased in a way that made it seem as though museums are hiding something. Right, so it's sort of um, we're we're you know say in the 1980s at our museum or the NHM and no one there was no information about Hans Sloan at South Ken in the 1980s or at least you if you wanted to find out you had to go to the library. Um, now, would you think that the you know Alan Gentry, dinosaur paleontologist in the NHM, you know from the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Um, or any number of our colleagues, you know, Tom Kemp, Jenny Clack, people who worked at our museum. Surely you don't think that there's some kind of um, uh, cynical, active attempt to, sh uh, you know, show a Eurocentric view of, of natural history. Surely it's an opportunity cost kind of issue. So to the extent that we do talk about the Hans Sloan, right, or a Boer concentration camp in South Africa that yields, I mean, it's really a prison of war camp. I mean, a fine line between the two that yields a specimen that we have on exhibit. I mean, that's not a, a happy circumstance of history. And it is an important thing that I, I agree with, with you. And I think everyone who's spoken so far that it's good for that kind of information to be accessible, certainly more than it has been. But the reason why you didn't find information about Hans Sloan in the, in the NHM in say 1994, was simply because the, for all their faults, the, the Eurocentric members of staff at that time were concentrating on comparative anatomy, biogeography, various parts of evolution and conservation, which, you know, I mean, talk about ethics, that's another role of natural history museums that has a pretty high li uh, list on, on importance. So I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm talking too much, but I, my specific question to you, Jack, is you phrase that first part of your comment in a rather pejorative way about the motivation behind museums in the age before decolonization became widespread. Do you really mean that? If you're asking, no, no, I don't think so. I think when, when we say people who have been hidden by history, and it, I'm not saying you know, pointing fingers on who's done, done the hiding, but it's the system, right? It's the system is hidden. Them, that they, when we look at our collection records, we'll say this object was collected by insert white man here, when in all reality, it would be any number of, of local collectors that worked with them. And then we've, we've just not recorded in, in many, many, many instances, we've not recorded that contribution. And the goal here isn't to kind of say that white man didn't do the things we said he did, it's to say that the contribution of all these other people is really important to acknowledge in the history of science. That's, that's what I would Say it's not it's not a destructive process. It's an additive process. It's um, yeah. It's it's not focusing on who's been doing the hiding. It's by being saying that they are hidden by the structure of how history, how science has been done in the past. And you're absolutely right that how you started that the the our museums talk about natural history. Where does this animal live? What does it eat? How does it move? And it's only in much more recent years that we talk about. The history of how collections come together. I think the important thing we're doing now is telling the whole truth, or as much as the whole truth as we can about that. Thank you. Tiff. Sorry, and my, my point was just mainly about the idea that we, we tend to be quite good at like listening to stories, and stories tend to hold quite a big um, 
role. And I was just wondering whether just when we tell stories and when we're trying to tell them, we make a conscious effort in trying to remember um, the, like when we're, so say if we're like tasked with the story, well, tasked with the task of um, telling a story about a particular um, scientific development, if we try and like understand sort of like the whole story and how it comes to play, obviously it's unlikely we will know the whole story ever um, in terms of things, but like trying to give that sort of effort in trying to know that and kind of in textbooks as well is kind of like highlighting that sort of thing. So sort of like trying to include it in the narrative, not make it like, it might not be, it, well, I guess when we're talking about science, it's quite, it will be sort of like focused on the scientific development, but trying to tell how we got there and just making sure that that sort of is a, con a con more conscious part of how we do things, I think might be helpful. Very good, thank you. Do, do you Tammy, Ella, do you have a comment on that? I think that is a really important point because again, what we've spoken about is the way in which science is told and presented is often within this white European lens. And that has become the standard. And I think by constantly challenging that, we can create a new standard where as close to the truth as we can kind of get, because again, history, truth, who knows what, that, that connection can start happening when we make that conscious effort, whether that be through museums, whether that be through individuals, teachers, just adding that one extra, two extra sentences to the narrative really changes the perspective and really broadens our knowledge. And I think it could be as simple as that, but again, that requires way more bigger systemic changes. Um, but I think remembering that because white European lens has been so centralized in everything that we do, we have to slowly start unpacking that a little bit more. Yeah, there's not much Very I would good. say without repeating. So yeah, you can go on. Very to good. So I see there are a couple more comments in the group chat that I haven't read out, but I, everyone can see those and they're, and they're not questions. At least I, I haven't read them as questions. If the authors of those comments disagree, please make yourself, uh, please say so. Otherwise, we are now past 8 p.m. and we've taken a lot of time from Temi and Ella and we're very grateful for every moment. We're very grateful for your willingness to join us for this virtual event, which uh, I think um, has gone quite well, in my opinion, and I hope all of you agree. So unless someone raises their hand, I'm going to adjourn this meeting and wish everyone a wonderful evening. But of course, before I do, please everyone give a round of applause to our speakers virtually in the camera, however you, you feel best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, could we just quickly just say, um, yep. thank you guys so much for just listening and engaging with us. Um, it's been really nice to just not talk between me and Ella, um, but um, we really hope that this has been really engaging for you and possibly could start your own conversations with other people outside um, and within, um, academia, wherever you are based, whatever level, um, and hopefully um, we can start seeing some possible changes in the coming years, both in curricula, academia, and in museums. But thank you again so much, everyone, for yeah. listening to us. Thank you, and don't yeah. forget Temi and Ella's uh, podcast at Anchor FM. The link is in the in the in, in yeah. the invite. But yeah, I just Thanks, add quickly to. Well, can I just add quickly? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, just thank you so much for engaging because as Timmy was saying, this has been a project between us two over summer, over lockdown when we were pretty bored and we just wanted to do some research and yeah. it's so great that you guys gave us the opportunity to really uh, be able to engage with people mm -hmm. and like, yeah, it's just so nice to see people really encouraged and really wanting to discuss this because all we see is really numbers on screen of people watching and yeah, to be actually have to, a discourse is great and someone said in the chat that you should read the book Superior and you should do that. And I think we should, I think we're probably gonna make like a reading list of some of the papers we discussed today. Mm -hmm. I think if we can send that out through the Natsuki SOC presidents, maybe that'll be helpful mm -hmm. to anyone that came to the talk. So you can kind of follow up on the papers that we referred yeah. to, but yeah, thank you again. <laughs> Good job guys, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Bye everyone. Have Good a lovely day. Bye. 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 <laughs>